So first, welcome, um, and thank you, Deborah, for uh, welcoming me. I'm James P. Asher. I'm an assistant professor here in the libraries, um, and this event is part of Scriptalab, um, which, if you haven't heard of it before, might be interesting to you. Um, we're an initiative run by the university libraries, and we intend to explore issues of materiality in media, information, and technology. We do lecture series. Uh, we have quite a number on the website, which is scriptalab.org, script a lab. Dot org, um, and you can look there, and, and in fact, this talk will be on there eventually, um, which is my first comment. Um, if you don't want your image online for some reason, speak to the gentleman with the camera, and they can remove you. Witness protection program, just fine, we'll take you off. It'll be just great. So, this is actually something of a surprise talk. This is the continuation of the 2011 Summer Book Arts Program. Um, and what the surprise is, is, is you know it's not summer anymore. Um, it's actually quite cold outside. Um, and what happened is, is our very generous sponsors were so generous that, that we could actually have one more talk kind of tacked on to the end of this event. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention these generous sponsors. Um, they are the Friends of the Library, the Graduate Council on Arts and Humanities, the University of Colorado Boulder President's Fund for the Humanities, the CU Art Museum, the Book Arts League, a wonderful group located at, uh, running out of Lafayette, um, and the Rocky Mountain chapter of the Guild of Book Workers. So if we have representatives from our sponsors, which I know we do, thank you so much for your generosity. Um, of course, none of this would happen without a incredible planner and you know, really the, the brains behind this particular event, the in indefatigable Deborah Fink um, and her assistant, Andrew Violet. So actually, please join me in thanking them for making this happen. Um, and additionally, if you're looking at this online rather than here, this also wouldn't happen without Michael Riberty and his assistant, Ben Batten. So please join me in thanking them for the people online. But enough of that. Um, let me get to the serious business of an introduction. And, you know, I'm going to do something a little cheesy with the introduction. I'm going to say, of course, we all remember the 2001 book by Jacques Derrida, Paper Machine right? This is the book where he talks about papers and machines, and this is kind of his encomium to scholarship in the printed form. He talks about paper as a surface and a machine as inscribing on the surface, and he does his, you know, characteristically deconstructive gesture, and he talks about how do we inscribe the surface. Maybe a paper machine is a machine for making paper, maybe we have the paper interface with the machine, and he's really dealing with kind of digital scholarship. But what I found really interesting about this book recently is there's a kind of paper machine that Derrida didn't anticipate. That you're going to learn a little bit about tonight. Um, the gentleman who, who's speaking, who you, you all came to say, see, uh, in some ways is a machine of making paper. He's been doing it for almost 40 years. Um, I actually wish I could make a chart and show graphically the sheer amount of paper that must be. Um, but really, we are dealing with... A, a man machine of paper. Um, additionally, of course, he founded the International uh, helped found the International Association of Paper Makers and Paper Artists, um, of which he was the first vice president and later the president. Incredibly important international organization for paper. Um, he also is something of a craftsman of several sorts. He's a binder um, and a printer. But more to the point of paper machine, um, have you all seen? the large kind of cast paperwork throughout the library? Yeah. If not, they're in these wonderful little uh, exhibit booklets, and you can look at them. And when I look at those, I saw something very interesting. I said, oh, these are absolutely beautiful. They're kind of this cast paper on top, on top of this kind of industrial architectural debris and painted this interesting ways. And so, so I asked our speaker at one point, like, oh, this is really innovative. Where did you get the idea for casting paper? This is, this is, this is clever. He said, oh, no, 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 this is totally normal. You know, in the 19th century, they cast train wheels out of paper. 
Um, and this baffled me. I had, I had no idea. Um, and this gets the sense I think Derrida missed. Paper as machine. And I think some of what the art you're going to hear about tonight, some of the work of our speaker, talks to this kind of new sense of paper itself as a mechanic form and paper as interfacing with the machine. Um, and it's one of the reasons I'm so excited uh, about his work. So let me say, without further ado, please welcome paper maker of nearly 40 years, master craftsman and scholar, Ray Tomaso. Thank you. So we're going to do a very brief history of paper making since I was only limited to five hours tonight. Uh, we're going to kind of skip over it. So this kind of tells you the story here of the idea. So this shows you some of the paper I've made over the years. This just shows you the deckled edges. Paper is always more impressive when you see a pile and you just see the deckled edges. The history of paper basically is broken down here. This papyrus is not a true paper. It's a reed that grows to 16 feet tall in Egypt. It's a triangular shaped plant. You slice the green outer bark off of it. And then you take the pith, you slice it into boards, you soak it for 24 hours in wood, I mean water. And then you take and crush it, either with a hammer or with a rolling pin. And then you overlap it like siding. And then you do a set perpendicular to that. You put it between cloth and a press. And when it dries, it sticks together. The same thing happens with beets and onions. You can slice them this way and make beet paper and onion paper. It works really well in a dry climate. It has a tendency to mold if it's in a damp climate. But it's not a true paper. The other ones are uh, bark papers such as tapa or amate from uh, tapa from the South Seas, amate from Mexico. Those are just the white inner bark of plants, or usually the paper mulberry, that's just beaten, damp, and felted together like you'd make woolen felt. You fold it back on itself, pound on it, spreads out. You found, fold it back on itself, dampen it, pound on it, folds out. And you can make bark paper, but it's not true paper. What you have to do is you have to take that fiber and you have to beat it and then put it into a vat of water, stir it around, and then pull it out onto a paper screen, which is what they did in China in 105. But what happened was this eunuch who was in charge of these things said, I invented this. They have since found examples from like 500 years before he announced that he'd invented it. So he just had the written word and good PR at the time and was able to write, I invented it. And there was no one else that could write and say, no, you didn't. So that was the first one. And then paper making slowly traveled around the world following the silk route. There was a little bit of, um, a lot of it had to do with um, wars and conquest and capturing paper makers because you know, back in those days, if you got captured, you became a slave or you said, I know how to do, and they just change you to the, change you to the paper vat and you made paper for the rest of your life, but you weren't out there in the sun rowing a boat or anything like that or moving huge blocks of stone. Um, the Arab invasion coming across North Africa and invading Spain brought paper making into Spain. And then if you notice the next one, um, the French, he was captured during the Crusades, put to work in a paper mill when he got back to France. This is a great idea because at this point in Europe, they were using parchment to make a Bible that took 400 animals, skins of 400 animals. So quite possibly you ate well. But, you know, it was a lot of work to scrape the hides off and tan, the, tan them down to get them to work. So what you're also looking at here is the, Cus the little clay tablets in Samaria, they were used to keep bureaucratic records of who paid their taxes. You needed parchment for that. The Ro in Rome, when they so uh, the Roman soldiers were stationed at the wall in England, they were writing back on wooden boards, on tablets. They were sending their letters home on tablets, wooden tablets. 
So all of a sudden, to keep all these government records and your tax, who paid what taxes, you have this paper. And it's a really simplifying life. And then you eventually, you know, uh, as paper makers, we push it's the spread of the intellectual ideas. It carries intellectual ideas. Thus Gutenberg printing his Bible. And you're trans transposing now from just making paper and writing on it to printing on it where you're speeding up the process. You can print more copies and distribute them to a wider group of people that could possibly read at that time. And then you see it moves further north. The first paper maker, uh, uh, paper mill in England was 1495. And then in 1680 in Holland, they invent the Hollander beater. And the Hollander beater, everything up to that point was stampers in Europe. There's examples of how to build a set of stampers and a water wheel. And you'll see it shortly in the movie. The Hollander was designed in Holland because the further toward the coast you moved, the less waterfalls you had until you were level with the sea. And you couldn't use water power, but they had wind power. And the Hollander is designed to pound rags into pulp using wind power. It took less energy. Um, it reduced the beating time in one day as much as eight stampers would do in eight uh, days to the rag and the rags no longer had to be putrefied. What they would do is take the rags, roll them into balls and wet them and set them in the basement and let them rot. That would cook the interior ball so it would be softer and easier to you know, beat. You'd have to throw away the outer two thirds of the rags because it was discolored and you know, it was just going to make bad paper at that point because of the mold and everything. The problem was if you didn't get there soon enough, they kind of burst into flames and burnt down the mill. They later went to having four corners in the basement of the mill and putting their rags in the corners and slaking, wetting them and slaking them down with lime. They'd move corner four upstairs and beat it, three to four, two to three, and start a new pile in corner one. So the piles would rotate and they'd flip them over and the lime would then start reducing the fiber. The Hollander, you got away from that. So what you're doing to the fiber is you're taking and shredding the cotton or linen rag. In this period, predominantly linen or hemp fiber because cotton was too hard to get the seeds out of. You would then uh, take this and um, dust it, put it in a duster, turn it to get all the animal material off of it and dirt because there was no washing machines at the time. And you had um, rag pickers and rag picking was not necessarily a good occupation because you were picking things out of the streets. Um, you would sh uh, beat the, sh the fibers in to loosen the material and the beating would cause the fiber to elongate and close the fiber tube. You're trying to get the hair on the fiber to stand up and take on water. Okay, that's the simple process. That would give you this example. You have raw cotton over here and the beaten cotton over there. Showing you all those fiber bonds. And what the beating does at this point is causes that hair on the fiber to take on an extra hydrogen atom and a negative ion charge. So what you have going on is a hydrogen bonding and an ion bonding going taking place. And when you press that onto the woolen felt, the hair on the woolen felt reaches up, grabs that, and transfer breaks the, um, the catch on the wires and transfers the paper to the wool felt. Okay, this this show this is a 1930s film showing you the mill in Arnhem, uh, Holland. It's an open air museum now. This is a transition mill. This mill has an overshot wheel that's being powered with water falling over the top of the mill. Other mills would have an undershot that would take more water pressure to turn it if it goes underneath. Other mills would have a turbine 
They had a tube that forced the water through a turbine later on in this process. So what you're going to see here is exactly this illustration in the Diderot Encyclopedia here of how to build one of these. And these are the stampers. The first stamper would have a chisel point. The second stamper would have three chisel points. And the last one would be a smooth point, you know, flat surface. So you have a coarse, medium, and fine grind, just like with a meat tenderizer. So you're tearing those rags apart. So at this point, they are processing the rags. This woman has a knife blade in there. They're, this is after you've sorted the rags into grade A, B, and C. You're also looking for other things in the rags that you want to remove, like spots. Um, later on in the 19th century, it'd be pieces of rubber, buttons, fasteners. This is the point where you'd put the, the duster in. After you chopped them up, you'd dust them. And then here they're um, going to do a very rudimentary washing of the rags. Oh, oh. And then they'd take the rags out and put them in the stampers. Now these, the sound you're hearing in here is ex equivalent to uh, six pile drivers. They required paper mills to be located on the outside of town, outside the city wall, because they burst into flames and they made a lot of noise. This gear behind this man is the same thing that would be running off of a windmill driven, like the Schoolmeister Mill in West Zan. And this is the Hollander Beater. And this is a cylinder with teeth on it that runs against the bed plate turns at about 400 RPMs and circulates the fiber in a trough. And he's about to take off the top and expose the roll. So this is the basic major advancement in paper making in 1680 that progressed through 1950. This is the machine that did it. This one, uh, there seems to be a little bit of a problem where he has to stir it to get it to go through. And he's, he's feeling the pulp to judge the consistency. Then they pour it into a holding tank and then from the holding tank, it would be spooned into the vat. The film you'll later see in the movie is a 1940 movie where they're using a power vat and everything's mechanicalized at that point. So he's using a pair of molds and one decal. So as he forms a sheet, he lets it drain. The kutcher, the man who's going to print place it on the woolen felt here, is sliding it up the horn to let it drain while he puts the next felt down. So there's a little dance, a little time sequence in here you have to observe of uh, how you're working, waiting for that paper to drain. So a production rate here is a choir, which is 144 sheets. These belts would also be heated from underneath where you'd have a chimney under the vat and the 13-year-old apprentice that you would have would get up in the morning, crawl down the tube, light the fire in there, and then crawl out before he's overcome with smoke because you want to exhaust all the smoke on the outside of the building because you don't want any of that soot falling in your paper. And here you see the laid lines and the um, watermark on the paper. The um, 
plank that he's cooching on is also slightly curved. And what he's going to do is put some extra felts on the top to, t to eliminate the impressions of the wood boards. And then he has these wedge-shaped pieces of wood he sits on there to compensate for the curve of the board underneath. Now at this point, once he gets this loaded, he's going to start closing the press. And this is a screw press. So you're working on that process of coming down the, screw, the inclined plane and acquiring pressure. He's blowing a horn because of the noise in the mill, from the stampers and the machinery pounding constantly to attract everybody to come over and help him tighten the press. So what they're doing here is they're adding a windlass to it, just like you'd raise sails on a sailing ship, to apply more pressure. As you can tell, this is definitely a 15th century, 16th century, 17th century operation. And like most of those occupations, it would eventually affect you and you'd become more and more bent over, allowing you to clear the rope if it's that high. Now, they're closing this press, and what they would do is they'd lock this press closed overnight and come in the morning and open the press. This mill is probably located right next to the canal where they're drawing water from. So it's a brick floor, so the water runs into the brick floor and then back into the pond out in front. They, they actually have modernized this mill a little bit. They've eliminated the uh, stampers. The last, when I was there, they'd taken out the stampers and they had a, a nice galvanized stock tank the guy was farming sheets in. Now they're going to undo the press and then when you put the paper in the press, the paper is approximately 90% water. So now that it's been pressed, they're down to sheets of paper that are approximately 60% water, yet very, very plastic. So they're going to have to use a little bit of care when they're picking them up and resetting them. And you'll notice the little bit of stretch on the corner when the guy goes to lay down the paper that he'll stretch it just a little bit. But you try to get as much of the paper as possible with your, your hands so when you pick it up it doesn't stretch a great deal. And they're going to carry this upstairs to the drying loft. And the drying loft is always located at the top of the mill because that's the warmest place in the mill. They're going to hang it on horsehair ropes. And you're using horsehair ropes because you don't get any color dis dis discoloration from the horsehair. There's no staining. On a vegetable rope, you'd get a stain. So they're going to hang these over the ropes. This room has shuttered windows with louvers. So if it's on a really cold, wet day, you can open the louvers and get more air circulation to try to dry the paper. These mills are always located in river valleys, so things dry real slowly. I was in a mill in France, and they could only make linen paper during winter months because it would dry too fast and cockle too much during summer months. So you're, you're doing a controlled dry. If the paper dries too fast, it'll really cockle. If you dry it really slow, it stays fairly nice and even. Then they go back to work. The felt's back down. They can make another stack of paper. The person upstairs will bring the paper down 
and the woman will curate the paper looking for defects. She'll have a knife. She'll cut bad chunks out of the paper. Then the paper, which you won't see in the movie, will then go back and twice a week they sized it. They had a big vat of gelatin. They would take a clump of paper between two boards, drop it into the gelatin sizing and let it soak in, take it out, put it on another board, another felt, another um, felt on top of that, on top of the paper, put it back in the sizing press, press it, and catch the extra sizing coming out of the press. Then they would take the paper and take it back upstairs, line dry it again for the sizing. And the sizing took like three months for it to soak in with the paper breathing in, pulling the sizing in. So instead of having a water leaf paper that was unsized and very absorbent like a paper towel, you'd have a paper that was hard enough you could write on it with your quill, you could print on it with your type, and what you would do is you'd dampen the paper before printing. So that is basically how you make a sheet of paper. Well, then you have the industrial side of life. And what you had originally was you had, in the Renaissance period, you had wooden book boards. As you transitioned out of the Renaissance period, they translated into paper book boards. So you could have these stiff covers on books. So the next step was, if you're already replacing boards, that you can glue up large sheets of paper and then waterproof them and do carriages and other items. It could replace wood on another scale. So at this point, what you have, the technology you have at your fingertips is cast iron and wood. And you can imagine, you know, doing a very thin panel of wood, what it would take to saw that out of a tree. That gluing up several sheets of paper like you would on a book board would make more sense and be much easier. So this is your, you know, transition. And it's the same thing as if you're build, building a Corvette. You're doing it out of fi fiberglass. You have more horsepower to weight. If you're making a paper mache carriage, you have more horsepower to weight. It's that simple. It's the same concept. You know, you want it lighter so you can move faster. And so there's another thing going on here is the Renaissance paper was wonderful because it was done in the stamper, a slow process which didn't cut the rags. It just pulverized the rags, just, just beat them slowly. The Hollander had a tendency to cut rags, shorten the fiber length. So the paper degraded. Not much, it's still rag paper, still linen paper, but it degraded a little bit. Along comes this Swedish chemist. He invents chlorine bleach. When something is new, people don't necessarily understand it. You know, there was a style at one time where you bleached your blue jeans. Some people didn't catch on that you had to rinse the bleach out of the cloth you know, they, went, they bleached their blue jeans, they went out into a rainstorm, and the blue jeans deteriorated on them while they were wearing them because chlorine affects the fiber length. Uh, there was a, you know, a book published in 1824 complaining about bleach. Somebody had printed a Bible in 1820 on heavily bleached white paper. It looked really good for the first two years. By year five, it was powder. That's a lot of handset type. That's a lot of work hand pulled on a wooden press. So you have that deterioration. So the next, so that's number two <laughs> or three. Then you have Nicholas Louis Robert designing the paper machine, which is great. You could produce a lot of paper, but the paper machine only has one shake now. The paper maker you saw was doing double shakes, so the fiber interlocked in both directions, so you have no grain. 
So now you have a grain in the paper, so you have to be careful how you fold it. Because if you tear it along the fold, you know, you fold it this way, and you go like this, it tears. So you have to watch out for grain now. So it's becoming weaker. You know, Thomas Gilpin went to England and visited all the manufacturing concerns, went home and wrote in his notebooks every night. He found one of the engineers that worked on the paper machine in England and brought him to America and built a paper machine. So there's an example of his machine made paper from 1819 sitting over there, which he put on it, Gilpin's machine made paper because it was a new item. And in, we replaced the screw press with the hydraulic press in England, starting in England in 1800 because you could produce a lot more pressure with a hydraulic press than you could with a screw which was beneficial because that compressed the fibers better. So after you have all those hydrogen bondings and all those hairs sticking together, when you press them, you're compressing them and closing them like staples. So when those hairs dry, they harden and you have a sheet of paper. And then you get straw paper and you're having to cook that with harsher chemicals to break down everything that's not pure cellulose. Cotton is 98% pure cellulose. And linen is, after you read it, do the reading process to get the linen thread out of it, it's almost pure cellulose. Wood or anything like that is a much stronger fiber. So anything that's stiff, you have to cook and remove. So when they come into the use of wood pulp, it becomes a sulfite process where you're breaking it down with acid. Other things that have happened here, um, Stanwood, he was living up in Maine. There weren't a lot of people in Maine. There weren't a lot of rags. So he was having problems with raw materials. So he imported two boatloads of mummies from Egypt and unwrapped them because you had 250 to 300 yards of linen in every mummy. And it wasn't the fact that these rag pickers came down with cholera that stopped him because he was making brown paper wrapping paper for the butchers and the grocers in town. That wasn't what put an end to him. It was the Egyptian railroad. For that 10 year period in there, the only fuel they used was mummies. You know, they're nice and dry, they burn well, and there's not a lot of trees in Egypt. So you have these little things going on, you know, that are happening in different parts of the world. In the 1857, England started import, importing esparto grass from North Africa, the same thing as straw paper. They were making really cheap cardboard with it. It was, you know, a really nice fiber for making something really cheap and really quick. And they had all these coal ships from Newcastle going down to the Mediterranean to fuel the fleet. They were coming back empty. They needed something in the holds. So they packed them with bales of grass from North Africa, transported them back to England, and made esparto. They stopped making esparto grass paper in 1960 because of the pollution. It required a lot of cooking, and a lot of black liquor left over from the cooking that they were pumping into the waterways. So it was the massive amount of chemicals it took to break it into paper. And then you got into stereotyping Stereotyping was actually invented in 1804 by the Earl of Stanhope. There's an example over there from the 50s, 1950s, when they were using it. And what you would do is you'd set type, you'd pour, put this paper on top, this paper flong, pound it onto the type, dry it, and then you'd pour hot lead onto it and make a printing plate. And then these would be curved to fit the cylinder, high speed cylinder presses and you'd print your newspaper. So you could put up five or six front pages and then redistribute the type and you'd print the front page and then melt that down. Page two would then go onto the press and you could do production work. And this is an ad. This would be sent out by the companies and the companies would then have you insert that on page three and somebody would lock it all up and pour the page three with that ad in it. So that's 
basically what happened. Also, you've got other industrial uses here where, you know, in 1700s, you were making carriage bodies. All of a sudden, it's the major plastic of the 19th century. This shows you a paper machine with six dryer rollers on the end of it. They'd come up in the 1830s with me methods of heating these rolls to dry the paper coming off the machine. Prior to this point, it came off the machine. They put it on felt, put it in a direct press, pressed it and hung it on ropes because they hadn't made the transition. At this point, they could make continuous rolls of paper and they invented a machine that could print continuous rolls of paper. You know, it was all of a sudden, it's, you know, like newspaper presses became continuous rolls instead of individual sheets. This basically breaks down what happens with the paper machine where you have the vats, the guys blowing the paper off the vats onto the felts, the guy bringing the pulp down the steps, the guys cranking the, uh, the press, the guys ironing it dry over here, the goats going into the uh, pot for sizing, sprinkling the sizing on the paper, and then you have these guys blowing it dry over here and, you know, the relief team up there on the balcony. And then you have the, the people finishing it with the calendaring rolls where they're actually polishing it between the rolls. And when you get to the polish, polishing rolls were a lot safer than the glazing hammers because the glazing hammer worked off that water wheel. It went up and down and not much stopped it. And you sat there and turn the paper underneath the hammer by hand. These glazing rolls varied from country to country. Some people put cardboard, four or five sheets between cardboard and ran them back and forth. And that slipping would polish them. The English likes zinc sheets and they'd polish them using zinc sheets. So this is the age of paper. They came out with songs on it. The man is dressed it is finest paper. You know, and they were making collars and cuffs out of paper. And your shirt got laundered once a week, but every day you needed a clean collar and a new cuff. So you just take the cuffs out of the cabinet, put on a new collar and new cuffs, and you're fine to go for the rest of the week. You know, someplace around Saturday night you wash the shirt. This shows you a paper mache village that was produced in England and shipped to Australia. I mean, complete. All the buildings, everything. You could ship entire towns by boat, prefab, you know, just kind of bolt it together when you got done. This is Eliza Waters. He was a pharmacist in New York developing unguents and potions and had all these little bottles that he needed to ship. And he was very dis dissatisfied with the cartons that were available. So he developed his own carton factory. He started making his own cartons. And from there, he went into paper boat production. From there, he went into paper dome production. So these are some of his paper domes. The paper covering on the Onion Dome at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, England, was erected in 1839, and it was removed in 1940 during the bombing to keep it from catching on fire, and it was later replaced with fiberglass. But it would probably still be there if it hadn't been for the bombings. So this stuff is pretty good. You know, the tar paper on this roof is probably keeping the rain off the books. You know, so they're still using the, this technology. This is the Tabor Opera House up in Leadville. We got the date on it? Yes. And what the paper molding did for you, and this is also a paper ceiling, was it cut back on your construction cost. You didn't have that real heavy plaster molding, so you didn't have to build the building as strong. And these things are still there except for the wall that fell off, you know. There was a lot of water running through that wall, and I've actually recast some of these for them up there so they could replace them. 
So that is a, it also cut down on your freight cost. If you were doing these moldings in metal, the cost of shipping the metal would be greater than shipping paper. And you had paper mache furniture. The 1850s formula for making paper mache was cutting paper into little smidgens, brown paper, craft paper, whatever paper you could get your hands on, and then pounding it in a, a mortar and crushing it into a paste. And then when they created the turpentine, the black, and they painted it on the object, they would put the object in a oven the first day at a medium heat to dry it. The second day, they'd put it in a much warmer oven to dry it the second day. And the last day, they'd put it in a really hot oven to you know, bake that surface so that it was waterproof, impervious to alkalis. So this is some of your paper mache furniture. So you can imagine the strength you're getting out of this stuff. These are examples of the paper boats. The bottom boat with the, the boy rowing is from a book, Voyage of a Paper Canoe, Geographical Journal, journey of 2,500 miles from Quebec to the Gulf of Mexico. There is also a website of somebody that just built another paper boat, had it out there. But you know, later on in the guy's photographs, it's starting to show some deforms in the sides. This shows you a paper locomotive wheel. And what that was, was the paper was glued together with wheat paste in a hydraulic press, the hole cut in the center, hub put in, banded like a wagon wheel, painted, two steel plates bolted in the outside of it, it would last for 300,000 miles. And there is an example of this in Golden at the Railroad Museum. So if you want to go see one, oh, there's not much to see other than the metal, but if you want to see one, there's one in Golden. And then they had um, these uh, wood fiber uh, tar paper sewer pipes. They hold up to everything but tree roots. Tree roots go right through them. They're actually outlawed in Mesa, Arizona. Uh, so then you get back to the other side of paper. Paper is used for cartridge, rifle cartridges during the Revolutionary War where you'd have them pre-wrapped. You'd make these up at night and have them in your pouch so you could ram them into your musket really quickly. The paper makers were in such demand during the, the Revolutionary War, they were not allowed to serve. They needed a making paper because it, there was a book on sermons of why you should have a revolution. It didn't sell very well, and it ended up being used for ramming muskets. Very practical application. The cartridge paper at the time included wool fibers in it, somewhat like you'd have fiberglass. You'd have another type of fiber in, interspersed in the paper to hold the paper together during the explosion. The second, the middle images show a cartridge shell with paper mache around the outside of it to fill out the form. So you didn't have to use as much metal to get it to go out of the cannon. And the other thing that happened in 1847 Ether alcohol was a solvent used on cellulose to, div um, to cause a nitrocellulose, which was investigated for explosives. In 1850, collodion, gun cotton, was applied for medical use so that if you had a wound, it was like new skin. You just painted this stuff on you and sealed the, the wound. Uh, it was also used in photography to secure uh, silver salts to glass plates. And then um, gun, in 50, 1852, gun cotton was ex, um, adopted as a propellant for explosives. 1860, a little more refinement, it became dynamite. Um, World War II, 
It was refined a little further and made into cordite, which is the explosives the British used. And on May 5th, 1946, six Americans died near Blythe, Oregon, due to the first intercontinental ballistic missile, which was the Japanese balloon bomb, which the government kept real quiet. They didn't want the people on the West Coast knowing that they were launching these things from Japan. So this is a paper balloon. So that's the scale of what you can do with paper. Or you can do something a little more mundane, like make dresses and clothes. You can spin it into fiber and make fiber, thread out of paper and clothing. I think the Japanese spun it into armor to make armor that protected them against gunshots and uh, swords. You know, the samurai swords were pretty intense, but you could develop a paper armor that would slow it down a little, you know, just by rolling the paper up. And you have toys. You know, this is very similar to some of the other things we were seeing earlier. The duck decoys in the 50s were all paper mache duck decoys. Uh, beer coolers were paper mache. All the ornaments, the Halloween pumpkins were paper mache. The Easter bunnies were paper mache. The Santa Claus boots were paper mache. And this shows you in 1967 the amount of paper people used. This is just before the petrochemical company took over and started giving us plastic. But this shows you how much a family would use. Today, this is uh, papers being used in architecture. Today, uh, we found online the reconstructing Christ, the church in Christ Church out of paper tubes. So it should be completed by it was either January or February 2012. So this is the house for the poet. It's a paper house for the poet, his library. The other one is they're doing 3D, 3D modeling using plastic printing. This is the English version using PVC and uh, paper, just office paper to make 3D objects. So this is me. I returned to graduate school at CU as my fourth graduate school. And as an undergraduate, I'd been studying intaglio printmaking. And I'd gone to Iowa in 68 for a college art conference and saw this print. And it was printed on a piece of paper that was one inch thick and embossed about an inch. And it was just like, wow. My etchings aren't deep enough. <laughs> so that got me interested. Uh, then my second graduate school was Michigan State. Garner Tullers was a visiting artist. He explained to me in about five minutes how to make paper. It's 2,000 year old technology. And so this is a piece of Garner's. So in my third graduate school, uh, I was studying tamarind lithography and it was all bleed prints. So we were art using arches, tearing the prints down to the size of the image, printing out to the exact edge of the paper, and you had all these tear strips. At the same time, I was doing three-dimensional castings of space in raku clay. So I was hanging out in the ceramics lab. I noticed a dough mixer and the, the paper shredder in the art office. I shredded the paper in the sh shredder, put it in the dough mixer, made paper, and they had a vacuum forming machine, so I vacuum formed a mold and I cast this piece. I watched it dry for two weeks. It was 30 miles outside of St. Louis. It was never going to dry. So in the meantime, I was setting up a book printing operation with friends. I was kind of bankrolling it. We'd gotten our type and our press. And our first expense was about $5,000 worth of paper. So. I got an offer from CU to return to graduate school. So I decided this time I'm going to teach myself how to be a, a paper maker because I don't want to be a lithographer. So I came back and this is one of the first pieces I created. It was in this office. I'm using a garbage disposal to pulp my 
rags, which I later found out you're not supposed to do. <laughs> so this was called Edwards Frill Shortcut to commemorate a bridge I used to take going home. The bridge didn't touch either bank. And there was only one board that extended all the way across the bridge and a lot of nails sticking out. So it was always a tricky operation crossing the creek, especially when you had two weeks of groceries in your arms. And I was also casting the print tables at night. This piece is four by six, constructed with ropes tied across the print room and boards. This one uh, included a chair. Uh, this is held on the wall with four push pins, if you believe that. The other problem was these things were too large to get out of the print room. So I later changed scale and made them a little bit smaller. I was dyeing individual pieces of paper as I laminated them onto my forms. On this particular instance, this is front and back, which then confused me because then I couldn't uh, think of which side I liked best and how to display an object that has both front and back. So this was kind of the setup I had. Clint Klein had gotten me a garbage disposal that was used in a remodel project. It was 20 years old. It was a star disposal. It had a toggle switch on it. Middle was off. One side was reverse. The other side was forward. It had no ground on it. So the longer you worked on it, the hotter it got. It was a cast iron sink, and you're standing in water. So you're trying to hit that toggle and get it to stop in the middle without, you know, the sparks. It tingled a lot, but, you know, you got good at it. And then uh, my second year, Peggy Prentice, uh, one of the twins of Twin Rocker, hand paper maker, paper making in Indiana, came to graduate school. There was a guy in town that suggested that he wanted to build a machine to make blue paper. And we went and talked to him and said, no, what you really need is a Hollander to make the pulp. You know, there's all sorts of things you can do for the machine, but making the pulp's more important. He was working uh, gluing ceramic nose cones to missiles for NASA and doing all these high-tech inventions. And he goes, yeah, oh, yeah, I could do one of those in three weeks. Gave us a price. We're waiting in you know, anticipation. We get a phone call three weeks later, and he goes, this is harder than I thought. It's 1868 or 1680 technology. And I since then had written a, read a book on the action of the beater published in the 1920s. By chapter two, they have no idea how it works. It was just like they have all these formulas and they just got to the point where we don't know. So he was figuring flow patterns on the machine at the Bell Labs here in town. I mean, he was using everything he could do to figure this out. This is actually the second tub. The first tub lasted five days. Seven coats of finish on it, and it deteriorated in water shortly. So that is the second tub. This one, if you didn't keep it wet, it always leaked. The back, it didn't come with a backfall, but they were tearing out a staircase out of Old Main. So being a good student that I was, I picked up this pile of scrap wood and moved it off for him. So I put a backfall in there. Every year I had to take it out and cut an inch off of it. As it absorbed water, it grew an inch every year. So I started making pieces my second year. I thought the, the large sculpture pieces were fun, but I should do something more constructive. And since I was in this book printing operation, these are all based on historic manuscript forms of how to lay out pages. So this is a series, cancellation of previous concerns. The X's are all done with aluminum litho plates. When you finish a plate, you cancel it. I was actually twisting them. The cancellation mark is an X, so I was twisting them and embossing them in these. So that then resulted in the staining as I produced these in layers staining color through the layers on the pieces to produce these sheets. These were then glued together and bound in this book by the two people I was working with in uh, Omaha, 
Tim Anderson, who did the woodworking on it, and Gretchen, who did the spine. And this is bound in a full deer hide. We were just lucky. By word of mouth, someone said, this guy in this butcher shop has a deer hide. So we went up to the butcher shop, asked, and he went back to the cooler and pulled out a deer hide that was rolled in brown paper. So we had a deer hide for the book. And then I got into Procyon fiber reactive dyes. So these are done with Procyon fiber reactive dyes. Some of this is actually transferred off the cardboard I was using. I got to the point where I used the same pieces of cardboard for the next 20 years. You know, they had needed character. And then once in a while you have a composition that just quite isn't quite working flat. So you fold it into a dimensional piece. And the ones you realized that wouldn't work as the dimensional piece went inside so you just saw the decals. Because this stuff is all stained with color and you really couldn't recycle it any other way. Then there was another period where I got into thinking, well, it's no fun doing paper. One should be doing metal. So the, and, and I am a printmaker, so you know we're doing copper. We're applying copper leaf to the pieces now. And that printmaking background, there was always so much fun playing with acid. So I started acid, acid etching these pieces. And then I had a neighbor that worked in a foundry, so I was designing these pieces so I could act like they were really heavy and hand them to him. And he's, he's buying it at six inches that these pieces are really heavy. So the other process is you're looking at, you know, I'm working from the Midwest, you know, the middle of the country. There isn't a lot of paper making tradition here, which is my advantage because I don't know what won't work. There's no tradition saying you can't do it that way. So it's free form. Everything's working because I think it should work. But you're also trying to catch up with the history and the apprenticeship programs. So in um, 18, uh, 1981, I went to Switzerland. Some friends I taught with at Ohio University were going to school in Athens, uh, in um, Basel, Switzerland, and invited me over to visit. They showed me there was a paper museum. I went over. I met Fred Siegenthaler, who was a paper maker. In 86, he put out a call worldwide for a gathering of paper makers to form the International Association of Hand Paper Makers and Paper Artists in Durham, Switzerland. So we all showed up not knowing what to expect. And it was a really strange afternoon. The two women dead center in the middle of the picture I had lunch with. You just picked everybody out of the small town in Germany that didn't fit and started talking to them. They all talked English, spoke English. So we sat down and had lunch. Then we went to this meeting. And three of the four of us at lunch were appointed to the board. <laughs> so we were the first board, and we worked diligently from 5 o'clock to 11 o'clock at night, putting together the organization. And then John, who is standing in the front there, invited me to come to uh, Berlin with him. He had a, there was an orange BMW picking him up at 11 o'clock and to continue working on the various things we had to do, you know, organization things, writing bylaws and all of that in uh, Berlin. So we headed off to East, through East Germany, crossed the border, which was an experience. So the thing that happens is, you know, you, your research takes you very bizarre places. And this is showing you the studio. This is about to make a piece. The pieces are two layers of museum rag board recycled. The scale in the middle is weighing out two pounds. The Hodges beater now takes four pounds of uh, recycled paper. I'm using a one horsepower mixer in the middle or up in the corner there to reduce it down get it wet, reduce it down so I can put it in the beater. In the, beater. The, other, the other corner shows you blue jean that I've shredded. Um, this is a valley beater, which will do laboratory work. It'll make blotter paper 
or you can design it to make currency, depending on how you operate the beater. So these pieces, I set up these screens, so you have air circulation. Theoretically, until you use this white, large ch chunk of plywood, which kind of cuts back the air circulation. And I am now troweling on textures under the plywood. That's why it's white in this photo. And then I start the first layer. The sheets all laminate together because of those hydrogen bondings and those ion bondings. So a wet sheet hits a wet sheet. It's permanent. So that's one layer. I do a second layer. And then you try to set those second layers so you know, it doesn't cross. The seams don't match. And then you come back with a blue jean layer. The blue jean layer, the first two have some clay content in the original. So they take a really good impression. So you can pick up braille. You can pick up the texture of masking tape. The third layer has shrinkage. So it tightens the piece. So it puts more strength into the piece. So it has a little more bow to it, a little more dimension resulting in these pieces. And once again, I got carried away. This gallery has a seven foot uh, French door on it. The diagonal is exactly eight feet. This piece is eight feet. The one thing I didn't calculate for was the door hinge hanging down. There's a railing outside this, seven feet outside this door that's four feet high. So it was a dense move, even on the model, we had to come over the railing, twist it, turn it, and as it slid through the door, it dropped past the railing and came in. Just like the model, it didn't want to go out. So what we're looking at here is a 1940 hand mill in England using a power that with a paddle wheel in the bottom of it, which is cranking it. So there's a flow going across the paper mold. So he's dipping into the flow to speed it up. The vat is heated. You see the steam coming off the vat. There is a power pump on it that is adding pulp, the same amount of pulp at the same speed he's taking it out. So the vat remains constant. So this is the standard in 1940 in a hand mill in England. My theory, my philosophy was if you pursue a craft to make art, the idea is to master that craft, find the history of the craft, so that you can force that craft to do what you want it to do. You're not under the constraints of making it making you do what it wants you to do. You need to understand it and be able to produce a piece of paper like this. Now, this is just a little piece of paper. That one got wrinkled in the drying process. It's just simply cotton rag and water. It's 2,000 year old technology. And my theory when I came here was how hard can it be? Really a lot harder than you thought. <laughs> so, do you have any questions? How much pressure on the Dutch uh, press? on the, uh, the hand-cranked windless press? They're, they're looking at somewhere between 20 and 30 tons. Dep that had a really small screw. A lot of them have screws about that size. So the larger the screw, the more pressure. Where now they're using 100, 150 ton hydraulic presses. So there was a step up in grades. Jay? So I really enjoyed seeing all of this. Thank you, Ray. But I'm really curious about, you know, the connection I love is that of kind of industrial craft and your work. And so you gave us all these wonderful examples of ways that paper was cast to make carriages and wheels and all of that. What do you think about when you're making, say, one of these large pieces? I mean, are you, are you thinking about a carriage? Are you thinking about, a, you know, toys made out of paper? Do you have a particular inspiration? Well, the paper I made in graduate school is really soft. And the paper I'm using now is really nasty. If you get too close to it and you move it the wrong way, you lose skin. And you saw me working on the pa that piece. I'm using belt sanders to take it down. And if I cut it, I use a table saw. So I, 
as I've investigated this, I've upgraded, you know, I'm using industrial tools to cut it. No more exacto knives. Mat knives, I just don't have the strength to get through it. You know, I use Japanese saws. You know, when I want to clean something up roughly, I take a Japanese saw because they're a lot sharper than the European saws. So you're looking at those kind of things, but you know, you're also looking at the chemicals that they used and going, well, I want to live another 20 years, you know. Maybe when I'm 90, I'll, you know, pull out the sulfuric acid, dissolve the stuff and turn it into pure cellulose. I was going to ask you if there was a metaphor for the aging process and, and, and moving from the softer to the harder and if there was a, a kind of emotional uh, thread that you've traced and if you've tried to well, articulate that. As you notice the one in the entry hall, I've been noticing the chairs bouncing on it now for, what, six months? And so far I haven't seen any marks of those chairs. And if you'd have made a soft paper, it would have been worn away. There was one, pa one piece that I was painting outside and it got blown into the street. And the only way I could tell the truck had hit it was the brown paper had a tire track on it <laughs> that I was using for masking. Then there was one that disappeared one day when I was working and I forgot that I had it out there. And I discovered it three days later. And it was one of those little temperature changes that came through and I found it in the ice and it had tire tracks worn through it. But where the tires hadn't been, the piece was still there in the, the ice. But it had become totally encased in the street. But, you know, they tried to make paving blocks for streets out of the stuff. They made horseshoes out of the stuff that lasted just as long as the metal ones and were more comfortable for the horses. So, you know, pull on it. You know, you thought I was pulling it. I mean, pull on it. Pull on it. <laughs> fingernails. Fingernails work well. <laughs> I did that to a blacksmith and embarrassed him <laughs> because it wouldn't break. But you can see how you can make a, a balloon bomb out of something like that, a paper balloon out of something like that. And depending on how you process it, there was a, a method of beating it for 20 hours and it went to a pro something they called horn. It made an imitation horn because they beat it to such a gelatinous state. I don't quite understand what caused it to circulate at that point, but you can turn this stuff into a, something that re resembles horn. You know, someplace beyond layout paper, someplace beyond currency. And currency is just simply a formula that uses 25% linen and then 75% cotton and the cotton is used for opacity. Linen's used for the strength and there's a mill in Tortosa, Spain that produces flax and hemp fibers. Hemp goes for cheap cigarette papers. The flax goes for expensive cigarette papers and currency. Ray, I know you use natural pigments in your, to color your works. Can you tell us a little bit more about what those pigments are made from and how you gather them and apply them? Well, there's this really great pigment dealer in New York City um, that you walk in and it's like a candy store. He has baggies of you know, different blues, baggies of different ochres. He actually has 90 different colors of ochre from around the world. Daniel Smith in um, Seattle also sells pure pigment. But if you go to Mile High Ceramics, the ceramicist, you know, they've been using natural pigments. Mason stains are just powdered glass that's been vitrified and turned to those colors. And since they're mineral pigments, they have a tendency to stay that color for eons. So you can constantly use that. Um, the architectural cut at I-70 up here out of Denver says geological interest. There are nine colors on, that, on the sands of those prehistoric oceans. So those are the kind of colors. I mean, if you're going to make something that's going to last you 1,200 years, you should have 
a pigment that's going to last you 1,200 years. But on the other hand, it's whatever color is closest, you know, whether it's a, cane, a can of paint over here, or that color of pigment over there, or, you know, those golden acrylics over there, or mason stains. I set it up so as I turn, I have different colors on different sides of me, so I can go to the colors that I need at that time. Or colored pencil, you know, if something didn't quite work, you come back and adjust it correctly. You correct it. Anything else? Can you tell us a little bit about the, um, the themes and the motifs that have been carrying through your more current work? You, there, there are designs that you'll see from piece to piece. Well, th there was one summer that I saw these plain air painters, you know, going outside and working in fresh air and doing their landscapes. So I thought I'd go out and I did the entire show, casting it in the backyard, painting it outside, looking at the mountains, and realized I was a cubist. <laughs> I mean, you know, I tried. I was out there. I was in the sun. I was painting away. You know, I was casting the pieces. I was looking at the mountains, and everything came out cubistic. But, you know, sometimes you don't want to be, you know, it would be a little more boring if they l really looked like mountains or they were just the indication of them. So basically right now I'm looking at those textures. At one time compositions were based on, you know, finding a desktop. Some people keep really clean desktops and other people have desktops that are filed archaeologically. By, you know, they could tell you what date it was by how far down the pile they went. So you knew you could date where you put that piece of paper by how close you got by the other papers associated with it, or opening somebody's desk drawer and the things that accumulate in a desk drawer that are unrelated, but for some obscure reason, they're kept in the same desk. And then it was like walls of the dreams. When you have a dream and you can see the wall in it, there would be things you'd find on there and the archeologists that would be going through and measuring these things and keeping records you know, some Freudian type person that was recording these things in their journals for you. And now it's more just overall textures. Yes. A piece of paper such as that, how easy would that be to take and break back down and recycle it into paper again? You have to beat it. So you have to undo all those hydrogen bonds and all those ion bonds and actually beat it to convert it back into a sheet of paper. I mean, into pulp to make into a sheet of paper. But it takes a lot less energy than when you start with the original rag. So they were, when the rag pickers were also picking paper. So they were also picking up anything they could pick up. It's like a book binder. If you look at a spine of a book, the spine has paper from previous books in it on the spine. I haven't seen... Um, a piece of paper in Holland that was Napoleon had issued some edict about taxes. It was about this size. And on the back side of it, when you started looking at it, you could see letters, chunks of letters in the paper where they actually repulp something and put it in this sheet. And on the um, Connecticut Current here, if you look closely at that, they're on the front page, they're advertising for rags and parts of cows because they need gelatin. And this paper, this printer had their own paper mill. So they could kind of control how much paper they had. They weren't at the mercy of some other mill. And if you look at it, it's a green paper. And you can see blue fiber in it, other fibers from, you know, whatever they could get their hands on to make the paper. So the... Um, the one next to it, the larger paper, is one full sheet. That's what the paper maker made, and they printed a four-page newspaper on it. Any other questions? I would like to thank my lovely wife, who spent a long time working on this PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> We
we have a lovely reception for everyone, and I think you'll be around a little bit longer to answer questions about materials. Yeah. So please join me in thanking Rachel Mosso. <laughs>